And All right. Good morning, everyone. I haven't seen the sunshine come out yet, but they say it's supposed to, and we're supposed to warm up to the mid-60s, so hopefully we get there at some point today um, before we have rain for the rest of the weekend. But welcome to our last virtual perennial school, and I'm Gigi Neal with OSU Extension in Claremont County. And with me today, I have Joe Boggs of OSU Extension in Hamilton County, and he is going to be presenting on Connecting the Dots, uh, Flowering Plant Diversity, Pollinators, and Pest Management. Well, thank you, Gigi. Thank you, um, <laughs> well, it's very good that this is being recorded. Uh, we don't have a handout, but then um, you'll be able to go back. If there are things I've moved too quickly through, you can then review them at your leisure. So connect the dots, flowering plant diversity, pollinators, and pest management. My first point is that I'm not going to be presenting recipes. Um, very often with this presentation, at some point, usually towards the end when I talk about flowering plant diversity you know then people ask well do you have a list I don't do that because I want this to be up to you I want you to be able to make these selections the bottom line is that you know there there are a wide range of plants that are flowering that draw pollinators that support pollinators and for me to then give you a list of my favorites would be just exactly like me giving you a list of my favorite cars, it's going to be up to you. You know, we have um, plant diversity times is represented by the but by butterfly gardens or other types of gardens like formal gardens. If you go to Smiley Riverfront Park, you can see a wide diversity of flowering plants. This is wing spread. Uh, uh, Frank Lloyd uh, Wright uh, designed building in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, and, and just a really nice diversity there. You see what I'm, I'm driving at here, naturalized areas. It's all about increasing flowering plant diversity and you decide what you'd like to see. And don't forget trees and shrubs. Buttonbush is actually one of my favorites simply because it can do very well in poorly drained soils, but also it is a huge draw for pollinators. Um, I also like the leaves, very dark green, shiny leaves, spireas. There's this is a uh, surfed fly, and we're going to talk a little bit coming to spirea, white fringe tree, service berry that you have the added benefit of the berries themselves. Now, you don't necessarily need, in my opinion, to focus on native plants. I mean, stop and think about native plants, native to where? Native to Ohio, native to the Midwest, native to the United States. You see where I'm heading? This can be a very bad problem in terms of trying to figure out exactly where these plants are native to. Does that mean that pollinators will not come to non-natives? Well, that's not true. Of course, black locust is a native. Some people don't like them, but they do provide fantastic floral displays that attract pollinators, catalpa, both southern and northern catalpa trees, uh, wonderful draw. Little leaf linden, silver linden, our native persimmons, which I really like because I love the fruit if you know when to harvest them. Hedge maple, now this is one where there may be a bit of debate on because this one can escape. So then try trident maple. But I'm bringing the maples in because they bloom very early. Now, there is one thing you need to consider in terms of helping to support pollinators, and that is to provide season-long flowering. So some of the earliest flowering plants out there are maples, red maples, trident maples, silver maples very early in the season, so that when pollinators wake up from the winter, they have something to go to. Can't forget buckeye, Ohio buckeye, and of course, the Ohio State buckeye, Aeschylus, uh, Aeschylus natosa. Can't forget that. That brings me to my second point. Insects suffer from a very serious image problem. We're going to talk about pollinators, but we have to kind of address this issue too, because here we have a nice home, and invariably some insects are going to show up, and maybe more insects, and then we have things that eat insects, then we have this thing that we don't know what it is exactly, and this can cause people to panic. 
and do something that maybe they shouldn't do. Now, I'm not saying insecticide applications are totally outside the realm of possibility, but don't spray unless entirely needed. In other words, frankly, don't spray anything until you see that the health of the plant is going to be affected by the problem. So consider a different perspective when it comes to insects. When I use words like flitter and flutter, what comes to mind? I think most of you will agree what comes to mind beneficial they had an animated beauty to the landscape like monarch butterflies actually one of my favorites to the red spotted purple and of course zipping and buzzing are two other names for things like hummingbird clear wings and then this really pretty little fly feather legged fly that's a pollinator and enemy of insect pests that's going to be a, an interesting theme that we're going to continue with on this so what about plant pollination? <clears throat> well, insects are beneficial, and one third of our food supply depends directly on plant pollinators, but we need to examine this a little more closely. Some of you have probably heard, heard this statement, one of every three bites of food depends on bees. And if you get amplified, believe it or not, you have a bee to thank for every one in three bites of food you eat. I'm not denigrating anyone, it's just that, you know, in fact, I used to echo this. I actually used to, to say this same thing. One out of every three or four bites of food you, get, you eat is thanks to bees. Huff posts, one of every three depends on bees, let's save them. Well, yeah, we should save them, but this whole one of three bites depends on bees is fake news. There's one of my favorite sayings, actually. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions, we can have opinions about this, but not their own facts. So let's just focus on the facts. And where can we find facts? You know, <clears throat> I didn't think about this, that I could actually, given that this is a virtual presentation, I could have, you know, stopped right here and shown a demonstration at Google Scholar. This is how I present this as a PowerPoint, but, uh, but let's just stay with us. Google Scholar, if you're unaware of Google Scholar, you need to be aware of it. This is your gateway to scientific papers. In other words, you don't need to depend on me or anyone else to read and, and interpret papers. You can read them yourself. You can read the science yourself. So if we typed in importance of pollinators, this is actually what will pop up or what popped up when I did this, importance of pollinators and changing landscapes for world crops. Now this is back in 2006 and it's in a very, um, important publication. I mean, if you're a scientist and you get published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, you have arrived. Importance of pollinators in changing landscapes for world crops. Now, this paper, believe it or not, is actually the paper that was misinterpreted by some people to get that one in three uh, uh, bites, uh, uh, for every one in three bites that you eat, bees are responsible or whatever. It's responsible for that, but it was a misreading. And this is why it's important for you to check these, check out the scientific literature so, your, yourself. This paper said 60% of the global production comes from crops that do not depend on animal po pollination. You know, there are quite a few plants out there that are self-pollinating, wind pollinated. They don't need to have the pollen moved by something, but 35% do depend on pollinators. Now in that paper, I've kind of paraphrased, they cite animals such as insects, including bees, as well as birds and bats. So what in the world happened to the birds and bats? Why did we drop the birds? You know, I contend it's because bees have enjoyed a better marketing campaign. The bottom line is that bees are important pollinators, but they're not the, so we need to be very well aware of that in terms of looking at what is coming to our plants. Many pollinators, like maybe hominids. So I'm gonna just uh, go off to the side here just a little bit and talk about some, what I'm calling some mildly taxing taxonomy. If you look at these pictures, I have them labeled based on the insect order. So taxonomy starts with kingdom, phylum, class, order. Now this is the major level for separation of insects. And I think everyone that's watching this 
knows the common names for each one of these. I think you probably know that is a bee. That's a honeybee. You probably know that's a butterfly. That's a beetle. That's a fly. And the name of the order can help to place that in the correct order. For example, flies. Now here's the first rule. P-T-E-R-A means winged. P-T-E-R-A means winged. So that's why pterodactyl. Well, we don't say the P, but it's why it starts with a P. Pterodactyl means winged fingers. What do you think die means? Well, flies only have two wings. Coleoptera. Coleo means sheath. So these front wings are hardened into sheaths that cover the hind wings and the abdomen. Sheath wings, coleoptera. Lepido means scale. And I think you can easily see, if you ever handle a butterfly or a moth, how the colors will come off because they're attached as scales. So scale wings. But I want to focus a bit on diptera because this is a misunderstood pollinator. In fact, I didn't know until not many years ago that the importance of flies as pollinators. And this green bottle fly, as a matter of fact, this is not a made up. I did not take this picture with the intention of using it in one of these pollinator talks. I actually just took the picture to show a green bottle fly on a, and it was on a flower. But I noticed that as I was taking pictures of pollinators over the last few years to do more of these types of talks, I noticed how often these flies were getting in the way of my photographs. I'd call them the green photobomber flies. I'd be trying to take a picture of a really nice butterfly and here comes a, a fly, you know, shoo it away. Until I started looking into the scientific literature a little bit and learned something that I didn't know. Diptera, flies are the second most important order of flower visiting and flower pollinating insects worldwide. I did not know that. Flies are very important. And they don't just come to flowers that stink. You know, some do, but most actually don't. You won't detect a foul odor that's attracting flies. Here's another paper, the forgotten flies, the importance of non surfid these are hoverflies. You saw a picture of one of those earlier. Diptera as pollinators. There's a vast trove of scientific literature talking about flies as being important pollinators. So don't tell them to buzz off is what I'm saying. So if we listed these orders in importance relative to pollination, well, we would start out with Hymenoptera first. Yes, they are the most important, but look at what's second. And then look what's third. And of course, the poor beetles are the fourth. But let's take a look at these, the order of these two orders. And then let's go to this false insect marketing, the butterfly garden. I contend it should be called the fly garden. But there are limits. For some odd reason, certain hydrangeas are very attra attractive to flies. We think it's, it was an accidental thing that occurred in terms of selecting. Now, I'm going to talk a little more about this uh, later, but you know, when we select plants, it is unfortunate that a lot of folks that are involved with that are not using attractive pollinators as a selection criterion. So in this case, it may have been kind of a little bit too far. <laughs> Friends and family plan for that. Actually, I need to go back. This is at the Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo. That's what we call it. And it truly is a butterfly garden. When we say butterfly gardens, that's where you do have a garden that's dedicated to attracting and supporting butterflies for their beauty, but it includes plants that support the caterpillars. If you have plants out there you've deliberately planted so that the immature stages of butterflies are supported, well, yes, it is a butterfly garden. So this is a, a, a wonderful approach to help teach people the importance of butterflies and moths. But there is a conundrum with butterflies. Are they pollinators or nectar thieves? Well, what I mean by nectar thieves? Well, these are insects or other animals, remember insects are animals, that, um, that are able to get nectar from a plant, but they do not support the plant's reproduction. They are not really truly pollinators. And if you look at the proboscis, 
the thing that the uh, butterflies use to draw nectar of these of this monarch, actually two different monarchs, look how long it is and look how long the legs are. And if you look at the insect itself, you seldom ever see pollen attack attached to the legs. Now I'm not certainly not denigrating monarchs. However, we do need to be a little we do need to be aware not to go too far, not to claim that they're doing something they're not. And all lepidoptera aren't equal. This little skipper coming in here and 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 moving amongst the flowers, it's picking up a lot of pollen. And if we look at the bumblebees, for example, look at how it's putting its head way down deep in. I love to watch these feed. Look at way down into the flower, crawling into the flower. And you can see pollen attached to this bumblebee. Carnivore incognito. This is, uh, look at the pollens on this blue wing wasp, pollen grains. See all the yellow pollen grains? This is an excellent pollinator. Now what's interesting about this one, and this is again gonna be a theme that we're gonna follow through with, this is a, called a solitary ectoparasite. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't live in, in a colony. This wasp seeks out these green beetle grubs, huge things. It lays eggs on the grub eventually, but first, I skipped ahead there, it is a wasp, so the first thing it does is it will sting this wasp to paralyze it. Doesn't kill it, it only wants to paralyze it. Then it flies back with this grub to a, um, to a chamber in the soil that, this, that the wasp has created. It shoves the grub in and then lays an egg on the grub and closes up the chamber. I've always uh, kind of felt a little sorry for these grubs. I mean, they're in the dark. They have little compound eyes. They can see this egg on them, but they can't get rid of it. It's really a horror story. But nonetheless, when the egg hatches, the immature wasp larva then feeds. Ecto goes inside and it comes outside, feeds on this grub. So what's the point of making here? Well, this is going to be a recurring theme. This is a pollinator and enemy of an insect pest. Dr. Dan Potter at University of Kentucky, as a matter of fact, has done a great deal of research on the value, for example, of having pollinating plants or plants that attract pollinators connected to trying to reduce pests in turf grass. So you can see that's, uh, that's how that works. Now let's talk about predators and parasitoids. So insects are beneficial, they add animated beauty, they are pollinators, but what about this idea, predators and parasitoids? I love this saying, the whole of nature is a conjunction of the verb to eat in the active and passive. So a little short segue. Actually, this is very nice that this is virtual because I can't hear, hear everybody groan when I give my little jokes like that. Entomophagous insects, entomo means arthropods, including insects. Phage is from the Greek phagian, which means to eat. So an entomophagous insect would be an insect that eats other insects or eats other arthropods. Now we have three different types and these words you're very familiar with. Predator, consumes the host from outside, it kills the host. And we're very familiar with insect predators, lady beetles, mantids. But remember these are animals, they're just very tiny animals. We have wasps and yellow jackets. You're probably thinking, wait a minute, they sting or how good are they? Well. What do they feed their young? They have to feed their young meat. So they use their very powerful mandibles, to go out and grab caterpillars and saw flowery grama to come back and feed it to their young. So these are very important predators. Of course, this is a predator. We know that's a predator. This is just a larger size. What does this bald eagle do? It goes out, gets fish, grinds it up, feeds to its young. Now this snake doesn't do exactly the same thing, but it's another predator. And of course, here's a predator at the zoo, kept back from the glass. If the glass wasn't there, we would see exactly how it is a predator. A parasite, now this is another term that we're familiar with, but I want you to notice something. Successful parasite means it doesn't kill its host. Well, now if you wanted an insect to kill another insect, 
a parasite's probably not a good choice, right? Because it's actually not going to be a killer. So we have a subset of parasites that we call parasitoids. Now this, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm suffering a little bit from some of the pollen in the air. A parasite that kills its host, often eating it from the inside. So what you're actually seeing, these aren't eggs, these are cocoons. And we're gonna really dig into this deeper, but this is evidence of a parasitoid. The immature wasps that are represented by these cocoons now, cleaned this caterpillar, these caterpillars completely out. This caterpillar, this catalpa hornworm was dead within an hour of me taking this picture. Of course, if you really wanna relate it to people, for example, here's a human parasitoid we remember from the movies, right? Yeah, busting out. Well, <clears throat> parasitoid, you've probably all seen this if you've had a vegetable garden. I've seen it, in fact, the next picture is in my vegetable garden. This is actually a tobacco hornworm. Now, we have both tomato and tobacco hornworm, and you can't forget that tomatoes and tobaccos, uh, tobacco are very closely related. They're both in the family Solanaceae, and the two caterpillars are very closely related. They're both in the genus Manduca, but we commonly in greater Cincinnati actually see more tobacco hornworms on tomatoes than tomato hornworm. But that name, you know, go, applies sometimes to both. It's not appropriate, but it, sometimes it does. And the hornworm comes from these horn-like structures. There's something I want you to notice, and we'll revisit this. This caterpillar is the same age as that caterpillar. So we'll revisit this in just a bit. But this is what they do to tomatoes. I found it just fascinating how our tomatoes can look like this without us even seeing these, even though when we see them, they are huge and they're very obvious. They just have great camouflage. For the rest of this, I'm gonna focus on um, the Catalpa hornworm. Catalpa hornworm, again, comes from this horn-like structure. They're all in the same family, all the hornworms, Sphingidae or Sphinx moths. And of course, Catalpa hornworm, targets our native catalpa trees, and they do quite a bit of defoliation, but they actually don't hurt the trees much, believe it or not, because of this. Some of the very early research done on parasitoid prey relationships was actually done on this, this relationship between this wasp and this caterpillar. So let's take a close look at the wasp itself. Catesia congregata or sometimes Catiza congregata. And there she is. Very nice little wasp, I hope you can hear that. And she uses her ovipositor, which we also call a stinger, to inject things into that caterpillar. Now, what did she just inject? Well, of course, obviously eggs. She laid eggs inside that caterpillar. Also venom. I think that comes as no surprise. You get stung by a wasp, you know, what really burns is the venom, but also a virus. And these unusual cells, I wanna go back here, teratocytes are actually on the eggs and then they come free. But here's an important point. What do these things all do? Well, the virus suppresses the immune system. So there's no rejection of the eggs and the, ter and the teratocytes. That's important and we have to, Remember, again, these are little animals and they have an immune system very much like our own immune system. So if something laid an egg inside and it wasn't protected, the caterpillar's immune system would attack it. So that's what the virus does. The teratocytes release a hormone called T hormone and the T hormone plus the venom suppresses development. Now, why is that so important? Well, if you are an insect that's feeding inside of an immature insect, it's probably not a good idea to let that immature insect pupate because when that happens, everything gets scrambled. Now, here's a, you know, actually, I, I, let, me, let me, I forgot a slide here. Um, I, want to get, uh, I want to remind you, remember I showed you that picture of the two uh, hornworms and I said one with the, uh, with the cocoons and the other without the cocoons, but they're both the same age, that's because that showed this suppression of development. But here's an important question that came to my mind a few years ago. Where does the virus come from? 
And I just assume some things. I just assume, well, okay, it's in the wasp's body. But then, you know, with the coronavirus right now, we're learning a lot about viruses. And, and it begs the question, well, where, how does it get passed on from, you know, a, a female wasp to its offspring? I, I mean, how does all this work? Well, that's what's neat. That's to me the neat thing about scientists. You know, they do ask those questions. And then they start seeking the answer. And the answer to this is pretty remarkable. Functional annotation of Cartesian uh, congregation. <clears throat> the brochiovirus involved in this is a, actually like a biological weapon integrated into the wasp genome. What am I saying? What is this paper saying? It is saying wasp's own DNA gives rise to the virus. The virus is part of the wasp DNA. I actually find that mind blowing. I think it's just an incredible thing. And frankly, that's what makes learning in science so much fun. So here we have the immature wasp larvae, finished feeding, this caterpillar is gonna die soon, coming to the surface. You can see they've made a hole and we get the leakage of blood from the, uh, we call hemolymph, and now they're spinning up the cocoons. Death's not immediate, so there can be a little bit more damage, although feeding is, is greatly reduced. Eventually though, this is what that caterpillar, this is the same, this is, um, actually this is a different caterpillar, but this caterpillar looked like this uh, very quickly. So tobacco hornworm, same idea. Same idea with the laurel sphinx moth caterpillar, but notice it's all the same wasp. It's interesting because Cartesia congregata is also called the hornworm wasp, which is somewhat rare for a parasitoid to have that wide a host range. Well, let's get back to the beneficial aspect then. We have predators and parasitoids. We now know what a parasitoid is, but let's just kind of finish this whole insects are beneficial by really drilling down on a very important aspect of insects. You know, sometimes I get asked, you know, well, what good are insects or what good is a particular group of insects? And I always take people back to this perspective. Insects are keystone organisms in all terrestrial ecosystems. Now, what does that mean? Well, to demonstrate the keystone concept, let's just build an arch because that's where it comes from. We have this keystone that's holding up the arch. Now, what happens if we pull that keystone? Well, we're gonna have some Romans show us what happens because they used arches. So they're marching forward. Can read what they think. There they are covered up. So I'm gonna pull the keystone. That's what they say. And we hear the collapse. That shows exactly what would happen if we removed insects from every ter terrestrial ecosystem. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? In other words, when we say insects have been, are beneficial, the earth as we know it depends on insects. All terrestrial ecosystems are collapse, collapse if we removed insects. They are keystones. So, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the next uh, four hours. Uh, Gigi didn't know this. We're just going to hijack this. Just stay here all day. Actually, for the remainder of this presentation, which will end at noon, let's talk about pest management. Let's kind of pull some things together here. Now, some years ago, I, in fact, I, I've been doing these for 20 years, monthly diagnostic walkabouts for green, for green industry professionals. Here we are at the Boone County Arboretum. Here we are at Spring Grove Cemetery. Well, we actually call it Spring Grove Arboretum and Cemetery. And here we are at the Cincinnati, well, Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo. And something that I noticed, particularly at the zoo, but also at Spring Grove over the years, was very few plant pests. As a matter of fact, at the Cincinnati Zoo, they do not spray. Spring Grove frankly doesn't spray either. Uh, they've, they've limited very much to only some herbicides, but they do not spray insecticides. Now, you look at the number of plants at the Cincinnati Zoo and they don't spray insecticides 
not to just protect the animals. They don't need to. That's the, the point. Every time I would do these diagnostic walkabouts with my good friend and colleague there, uh, 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 Steve Foltz, director of horticulture, I would continually <laughs> not see pests. And I wondered why, and I should have known the answer because the next part of this talk, I'm gonna be talking about some friends of mine in entomology, and I should have known the answer. I just didn't put it together. The answer comes from pivotal research that was conducted some years ago that led to this concept, disasters by design. Now you gotta be careful. If you Google disasters by design, I hate to tell you, you'll mostly see bridge collapses and building collapses. But disasters by design was a concept that originated by these three people. Now I need to introduce them in a, in a directed path. Dan Herms was, uh, was for a long time, was the chair of our entomology department of Ohio State University. He's now with David Tree, uh, directing their research. Mike Raup as, is at the University of Maryland and his wife is Paula Shrewsbury. Now I want you to notice these pictures. So there's Dan, you know, the Stanley Club, uh, Stanley Cup. Mike is actually eating a cicada, and Paula had to work with these two guys. I really like her expression. But anyway, let's focus on the research. These three papers were pivotal. The work behind these were pivotal. And there you see in 2012, disasters by design, outbreaks along an urban gradients. I knew about this for years. I've heard Dan and Mike do presentations on this, but I have to be perfectly honest that, you know, well, I'm a slow learner, I admit that first, and then I didn't put it together very well until visiting the zoo. But let's talk, let's really delve into what this is all about. And let's first talk about this urban gradient idea. Well, you know, in Ohio, I mean, in greater Cincinnati, for example, and much of Ohio, we start with it that we had Eastern deciduous forests. We didn't have coniferous forests throughout the state. We actually didn't have throughout much of the state, it's kind of a misconception that we were a prairie state. No, we weren't. We were a heavily forested state. Of course, Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, Kentucky, heavily forested. And then we come along and start bulldozing out the forest so we can, well, we can get rid of the trees so we can name the streets after them. I love this saying. Suburbia is where the developer bulldozes out the trees and names the streets after them. Now this is about 10 miles from my house and I actually saw this put into demonstration. First of all, there's a street being named, Ashdale, now it no longer really exists, but if we take a look at just down the street from, down the road from where I live, where this bulldozer is, is this street. Look what they named the street, Woodview Way. I want to go there sometime and add this, Woodview went away. At any rate, this starts the process of going from a very diverse group of plants to less diversity. This is the urban gradient. Left behind to die, these trees were there before this parking lot. So monocultures by subtraction, look at this poor tree. It was there in the woods, then they put a parking lot around it, but they kept the tree so that it would shade the cars until it finally dies and falls on them. But this is monoculture by subtraction. Monocultures by unnatural selection. So then we've taken out the trees and we start replanting some trees, but we're selecting things that we want to have that may not be the things that were there before. Something to just keep in mind. We just keep moving things in one direction. This hospital, for example, only has about five species of trees in the entire area. I mean, it may be plus or minus two or three, but I can tell you the dominant number of trees there though are only three species in the entire complex. And of course, this is, I don't know what's happening here, trees over, Things, but the urban gradient, so this is how it works. We start with high diversity, you know, in our forested areas. Then we move into a kind of a first level of reduction where there are trees left, but you know, we're starting to sculpt things. We're starting to change things. Then a second level reduction. And then finally a monoculture. This entire parking lot is calorie repair. So that's the urban gradient. 
so let's get back to the relationship between plant abundance diversity and diversity of arthropod pests. Let's get back to the research by the scientists I've already introduced you to. So Paula and Mike took a look at 212 landscapes with a low diversity uh, uh, of, of around three species, high diversity of about 38 species. And here's what they found. Now, just a little bit on statistics. This 13.1 plus or minus 2.6, if we added that number or subtracted the number, and it would be overlapping this number with that number added or subtracted, these would not be statistically different. But I think you can clearly see generalist predators between simple landscapes. Let's go back, simple, low diversity, high diversity. Between simple landscapes and complex spiders, same idea. And let's look at a pest they looked at, plant bugs. Now, that, of course, you're not gonna have a lot of pests, but again, statistically different with more pests in the simple landscapes compared to complex landscapes. So then actually Paula did a little bit more of this work on azalea lace bugs. Now we, over much of Ohio, at least my part of the state, we can't grow azaleas very well, but Northeast Ohio and Eastern Ohio we can, and they do very well in Maryland. And one of their major pests is azalea lace bug. We can also have this insect, produces stippling and can cause azaleas to take on kind of a chlorotic appearance. So look what happens between <coughs> complex and simple landscapes in terms of the number of lace bugs. Simple landscapes, okay, there's the number. And again, this bar represents that same statistical overlap, except it's hardly needed. Take a look at complex. <laughs> it is amazing, look at the difference between the number of lace bugs in a complex landscape compared to simple. Again, it is mind blowing. And then of course we add flowers and this is really getting us in the direction of the major point of my presentation. So they added flowers to the landscape, but they first started with just the azaleas themselves. You can take a number of natural enemies. I'm sorry, I should have said it this way. Okay, so this side of the graph shows number of natural enemies. This is the number of natural enemies that they counted at different times from June to, uh, through mid-July with just azaleas. But then they added flowers, coriander, just adding one flower to the landscape, one type of flower to the landscape. Look what happened to the number of natural enemies. Then they added another, Shasta daisy. Look at what happened to the number of natural enemies as compared to landscape that does not have any flowers. I mean, azaleas do flower, but not to the extent that we're talking about these other flowering plants. So what is going on here? Well, let's connect the dots. What's going on is flower power clearly leads to increased natural enemies. It clearly, or decrease, would decrease flower power. There is clearly a connection between these two things. And we'll start by going back to the parasitoid wasp that we saw the cocoons of. And these are the wasps that emerge. A little side note, I hate to tell you this, but there's a little trick entomologists, myself included, use to take pictures of insects that are buzzing around. Um, if we put them in the refrigerator, it slows them down because they're cold blooded. Unfortunately, I left them in a little too long, so these are permanently slowed down. But nonetheless, here are the females that came out of this caterpillar. They're little wasps. We already know they're little wasps. But let's ask ourselves this question. What do those females eat? Or do they eat at all? Well, in fact, they do eat. The females eat nectar. They have to have nectar. They have to have nectar, carbohydrates, and also in that nectars, other things, uh, minerals and so forth, that keep them alive so that they can lay eggs. And they can lay eggs on all these different pests. Now here we have another insect, beautiful little, little wasp called the stink bug hunter. It says it all, doesn't it? Stink bug hunter goes after things like brown marmorated stink bugs. 
what it does, it digs into the soil. Soil. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> these shots were taken at Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, and there was a sizable colony of, of these that is has led to actually some research by a, a grad student at the University of Kentucky to learn more about them. But what they do is they go out, they get a stink bug nymph, an immature stink bug, they paralyze it, they bring it back to their burrows. You already heard that story story earlier, and that's what the immature wasp eats. So what do the female wasp eats eat? They eat nectar. There's gonna be a recurring theme here, I think. You've already seen this before. I used it earlier because it is a beautiful little fly. It's called a feather wing, a uh, feather legged fly, and you can see where it gets its name. This is a parasitoid of true bug. Once again, why do you think maybe we're not seeing as many brown marmoned stink bugs as we thought we would be seeing at this point in our distribution? Well, these things are helping to suppress the populations. What do the flies eat? Nectar. Let's talk a bit about predators. Here are all these different predators. And I said earlier, we'd be talking about hoverflies, surfed flies again, and that's what we're gonna do. Please remember, diptera, D-I-P-T-E-R-A, means two wings. You can clearly see two wings, and what I think is a actually pretty little flies, but one thing that I need to uh, emphasize is that um, very often these hoverflies are mistaken for bees. Sometimes people call them sweat bees. But from here on out, how are you going to know that it's not a bee? You're going to look at the number of wings. If you only see two wings, it's a fly. Now, what do these flies do for a living? Well, the immatures look like this. They are maggots because they're flies, but these immatures hunt down and eat aphids. They are a very important aphid predator. But look what the adults are. So the immatures take out pests, the adult, or aphids, the adults, nectar. Now you'll even find them on some of our selected roses like knockout roses, but Unfortunately, you won't find many, if any, on hybrid teas. Now, I like hybrid tea roses. Very beautiful roses. I mean, you, you know, they were, they were uh, bred to be used for their beauty. But I will tell you that they also represent what can happen if we totally ignore pollinators in selecting plants. By and large, the hybrid teas have been bred away from being attractive to any pollinators. Again, I'm not denigrating hybrid teas. I like, I really love the plants. I love the flowers. Has gotten me out of trouble a few times, my wife, right? So hybrid teas, but on the other hand, they, the breeders did not use pollination as a selection point. How about these beetles? This is a goldenrod soldier beetle. Larvae live in the soil, feed on insect eggs and insect larvae. So the immatures of this beetle are very important predators of rootworms. This is a spotted cucumber beetle, which is also called a southern corn rootworm. What do you think the larvae of this beetle is, is what do you think preys upon the larvae of this beetle? It's the larvae of this beetle. So it's a predator, but what do the adult beetles eat? Pollen and nectar. It's also a pollinator, a twofer. Pollinator and predator. And you can find them all kinds of different things. This is a Pennsylvania leather wing. You can see these markings here will differentiate, or the markings, I'm sorry, on the, the thorax for the Pennsylvania leather wing and the, the margined leather wing. You can see these dark markings here on the thorax, uh, the prothoracic shield. My point is though, that we have many different beetles that are pollinators, but also they're predators. This is one of my favorite wasps, thread-waisted wasp, dig burrows, provisional larvae with a paralyzed caterpillar or sawfly larva. So what am I saying? <laughs> what I'm saying is, this is what hey the larvae Joe. of this wasp eat. Hello? Yeah, I think we got, okay, we finally catch up. 
Did we catch up? Was I going too fast? We should have thread wasted loss. Was that what everybody's seeing now? Yeah, should be. Dave McFerrin, you commented on that. He said it's back. We're good now. All right. Good thing. All right, so here we have all the larval food items for this thread wasted wasp. These are all, what do we call these? These are all pests. And so this wasp goes after things that we normally call pests. What do the adults eat? I think you're just getting the same theme over and over again, nectar. So this is a pollinator that is also, of course, a predator. Finally, paper wasps misunderstood stingers, yellow jackets, bald-faced hornets. Once again, you have this connection between this plant and what's going on here. So with paper wasps, you can see here are the adult females and they're minding the store. And if we look closely, we see what's inside their paper nests are these little legless larvae that have to depend entirely upon being fed by these worker females. Now, if they were just fed sugars, you know, what would, they, what would happen? No, they actually had to be fed protein in order to develop. So what do the females feed the grub-like young wasps? Well, here's a shot I took several years ago, and this is showing a paper wasp. Unfortunately, this is a parasitized <laughs> Catalpa hornworm, but you can see she's grinding that caterpillar up, and she's going to bring that protein, that meat, back to feed the young. But what do the females eat? You see these all the time, particularly on goldenrod. They eat pollen and nectar. So again, this, this connection over and over again. Now I'm kind of going to skip ahead here, just, well, not too far, uh, so that we can get done on time. Because what I want to do is I want to connect the dots by putting this all together using a real life example. OK, I think you've all gotten the idea that I'm making the case we want to diversify landscapes in terms of flowering plants because those flowering plants attract pollinators that can also be predators and parasitoids on other insects. It means that simply by diversifying our landscapes with more flowering plants, we can reduce the need to apply insecticides. That's pretty powerful, in my opinion. That's very powerful. So here's a case study showing how this works. And we're going to use common bagworm as the example. Now, this isn't bagworm. These aren't bagworms either. Now, again, I, I grew up in West Virginia, and we called these bagworms and these bagworms because they look like silk bags in the tree. They did kind of look like that. But they're not bagworms. This is a bagworm. And so what you're seeing, what you would see here if you opened this up, is you would see there's a caterpillar inside this, a moth caterpillar inside this bag. And it uses silk to create its little habitat, but then it uses pieces of its host plant on the outside, which provides perfect camouflage. It's amazing how these things can remain below our radar. Now, we're also gonna bring to bear a little bit on integrated pest management. Of course, many of you probably were taught this as a pest management approach, where we combine chemical culture and biological tactics to keep pest populations below some sort of threshold. So with bagworms, you know, <clears throat> we could do chemical applications, but there's a very, a couple of very serious problems. First of all, is something we call asynchronous development. Right now, bagworms that are out there that you find hanging on a tree are actually, may contain, some are empty. That's, those were the male moths that emerged. Other bags have this thing inside of them. It looks a lot like a caterpillar, but it's dead. If you open it up, you'll find it can contain anywhere from 500 to 1500 eggs. Those are the females from last year. But in terms of when those eggs hatch, which will happen sometime in June, it depends on the side of the tree. It depends on a lot of things, but it's pretty, it's pretty obvious, I think it would be obvious, that, it, uh, that the, the eggs that are exposed on the southern or southwest side that are kept warmer are going to hatch before the eggs that are on the north side of the tree. 
The other thing I want to bring to your attention is that the early instars, so these are some rules. Early instars, the smallest caterpillars are the most susceptible to our insecticides. So here's a shot I took last year. At the same time, look at the size difference. Little caterpillars that are most susceptible at the same time on this same host, juniper, that we had these big caterpillars. If I'd sprayed, well, this isn't my plan, but if I'd sprayed, okay, I could have killed these. I may not have killed these. That's a very important thing. So that means insecticides aren't entirely, they're not entirely uh, helpful. Now, if you did want to use an insecticide and not wreck other things, you might use Bacillus syringiensis, uh, a naturally occurring bacterium, but even more so, uh, it is most effective on small caterpillars. It would not even kill, these are starting to get the size that it would not work. And by the way, you might say, well, Joe, why didn't it kill these big caterpillars? When, when the caterpillars get to this size, depending on the insecticides, they may sense the toxicant and actually pupate early. So they dodge the bullet to return next year. What about cultural? Very important, cultural. You can have a direct approach with cultural. Now remember I said that right now, the females are these dead caterpillar-like things that are full of eggs. That's where they are right now. That's how they overwinter. So we could pull off your digital IPM tool. And these are actually some junipers in front of my house. I hate to say this, that I did not notice because of their wonderful camouflage, but I'm gonna use them to demonstrate plucking common bagworms off. I have a handful of bagworms, I have bagworms in the bag, bigo bagworms. What I'm gonna do with these, I'm gonna to apply a two-step bagworm control method. Lay them on the, con con uh, lay them on the concrete, that's step one. Now, you know, for the recording, I also need to have this in here, that the following is, uh, uh, you know, rated uh, TVMA for violence, uh, TVMAV. So I just wanted to make sure if the kids are around or anything, you move them away from your monitor because step two is pretty, pretty violent. You do want to stomp on them, you mash them down. There's no coming back from this. I sometimes like to pretend that that's the last thing they ever saw. You know, you can have a little fun with it. Yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> An alternate method is you could build a little fire. And I'll be very careful if you're using fire. One of my favorite movies. I'm sorry I had to put this in there. But <laughs> yeah. at any rate, we can all laugh at these things a little bit. But let's finish with biological. Let's bring it all back together, connecting the dots. What happened here? This is at a Christmas tree plantation I visited um, several years ago because the uh, the owner was called and you know he said he had a lot of bagworms wanted me to come out and see if there's anything we could do and it was a little too late to do much but nothing really needed to be done because what happened here was this big gapping hole was created by this insect bald faced hornets on his property right along back in the tree line were actually two bald faced hornets nests now remember what I said earlier about the um, paper wasp adults having to feed their young meat. It also applies to bald faced hornets. And this poor bagworm caterpillar, I mean, it did not stand a chance because the mandibles on this insect is hugely powerful. It's used to go out and harvest wood fibers to grind up into, uh, 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 to mix with its saliva, grind it up to extrude paper. So. The poor caterpillar did not stand a chance. And this just, to sh it just goes to show you, if you do keep a, a lookout, you will see bald faced hornets also going to feed on nectar and sometimes pollen. More flower power. Now, if you look at the end of this bag, you'll see there's a little hole. What happened there? Well, it's not where the bagworm came out. It's actually where this parasitoid wasp came out, Idoplectus conquistator. And there is the female. Actually, this is another bag. I pulled this out. There's the female. And you can see now she's puffed out her wings or in the process of it. And 
there's its ovipositor, very important parasitoid. But let's take a look at the scientific literature. This is back in 1976. Factors affecting the survival of larval and pupil stages of the bagworm, common bagworm. And in that paper, it says the, the ichneumonid Idoplectus conquistator, you've already seen that, counted for most of the parasitism. So this can be a very effective parasitoid. So let's take a look at this paper in 2005. Conservation biological control in urban landscapes, manipulating parasitoids of bagworms. Now I'm going to pull out some information from this particular paper. First, the parasitism rates of bagworm and their research study was 71% higher in shrubs that were surrounded by flowering forbs plants than in shrubs that lack flowers. Well, there you have it. But it gets even better. And uh, parasitism rates exceeded 70% in shrubs that were adjacent to a central bed of flowering forbs, but less than 40% in shrubs that were further away. What's the take home message? If you have flowering plants, near plants you want to protect for bagworm, you're gonna have less number, you have fewer numbers of bagworms. That's the take home. That's connecting the dots. And don't forget about flower power of trees and shrubs. This is my good friend, Steve Foltz, who will speak for the trees. Well, there are many tree lovers, myself included. So trees can also like this cornus moss, will also support and attract pollinators that are also parasitoids and predators. The bottom line is flower power and natural enemies are connected. If you have this type of a landscape, you have fewer bagworms, fewer general defoliators like these yellow neck caterpillars, fewer sawfly larvae like these red-headed pine sawflies. This isn't just a pollinator garden, it's a pest management garden. And my entire point is that this is an ecological approach to plant pest management. Well, just take a look at all these different pest management gardens, including a butterfly garden, which I would like to call a fly garden, but that's another matter. At any rate, we're getting close to the end. I'm sure everyone out there is, is dancing now, feeling good about getting close to them. My overarching point is diversify landscapes. Diversify landscapes because flower power equals pest management power. And maybe a few flies. One of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite sayings, the true voyage of discovery lies in not in finding new landscapes, but in having new eyes, maybe compound eyes. I hope that this presentation has helped you understand this connection between doing something that as gardeners, we all like to do, we all like to have more flowers. We like to have landscape that shows more flowering plants because they're beautiful, but also the important side effect is they reduce the number of pests. And that does bring me to the end and I'm gonna back away so that uh, we can take a look at questions. Okay, so if you have additional questions, please put them in the chat box, or I see a few people put them in the question and answer um, comments too. Uh, there's one in here. Um, I'm, that I'm says, sorry, I, I just looked at the Pine Bluffs thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, that's what that's what I was getting ready to read. Was the Pine Bluffs took and they took down all the pines. Um, then we have a comment that. Sarah said she has a farm, family farm where they have a campground and that their family uses throughout the summer. Last year, there was a time of uh, a swarm of insects. So the crops nearest the campground last year were soybeans. Mm -hmm. Now I'm wondering if these were flies. They rem reminded me of the sweat flies or sweat bees, but they did not bite. I will look closer this year and see if, if uh, what they might be in the crop this year should be corn. <laughs> well, and, and one thing I, I will have to say, and, and it's in and, and Sarah, great, you know, it's great that you're uh, making these observations, but we can help you out if there's any way in the world of capturing these by by uh, image, you know, by taking pictures or whatever, uh, we can help to identify those for you. But there is a bit of a challenge here. And that is that, of course, we have a number of insects, a number of different flies. Uh, that will mimic one another and do very different things. So it would be good for us to 
to maybe have a little bit more information uh, on what's happening. Uh, it could be coming from, you know, another plant, probably not so much the soybeans. I mean, what do you think about that, Gigi? I mean, soybeans, you know, they do flower, you know, but I don't see them attracting a whole lot of insects like I this. Don't, I don't see them attracting that type of fly either. Yeah. Um, I will say that just being at my, my campground last summer down on the river and everybody was complaining about these stupid sweat bees, stupid sweat bees. <laughs> well, it wasn't. They were just, they were flies. Well, and there is a midge fly or a type of fly called a midge fly. I should have said this and you, you mentioned that. Oh, that, that was a whole other different time frame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Midge flies, though, uh, they swarm, uh, and uh, and mm -hmm. it's very common. The larvae actually are decomposers. They live in uh, in they're what we call semi-aquatic, so they live in soils that are very moist. But then the adults come out. They don't bite, but they can be a nuisance just by their numbers. All right, well, and what by their of... numbers. One thing that we noticed last summer when they did swarm um, is that they like the color yellow. A lady has a truck down there, and oh, her yeah. truck was covered solid and er, and it was yellow. Nobody else has seemed to be bothered. Well, that's so, that's anyway. A, that's just a little yeah something well, I that, saw. And, and I want to, you know, that kind of go, what kinds of flowers attract the bald-faced hornets that uh, Karen is asking that question? Well, you know, I'm, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, and that is a bit of a challenge in this whole presentation. And that is, and it's something that we're hoping um, to get some help with. So back to the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, they have a group of volunteers called the Buzz Troop. And they have been taking pictures over the years of pollinators coming to different plants at the zoo. Uh, but we haven't done, again, I say we collectively, because I haven't spent enough time to help. Ohio State's helped uh, a bit with this. Uh, Denise Ellsworth and others, uh, I should have mentioned her earlier, does a, she does a lot of work with pollinators uh, based at our research center in Worcester, Ohio. But my point is, is that that we haven't simply paid, in my opinion, enough attention to what these different insects that we think of in a whole different way, like, for example, your question, bald-faced hornets. Well, I've seen them coming to a number of different plants. They seem to be pretty selective, just as if you wanna find a paper wasp in late summer, you're gonna go look at goldenrod. They love goldenrod. Uh, paper wasp and goldenrod go together. Uh, I don't have that same information for bald-faced hornets, but hopefully over time, uh, we'll be able to acquire that. Any other questions here? I mean, we're a little over time, GG, and I'm sorry oh, I just fine. stepped we're in fine. on that. Yeah. <laughs> nope, we're fine on time. Um, the recordings can be found on the OSU Extension Claremont County uh, YouTube page. Uh, I did provide the link further up in the chat box, but I will also send that link out uh, once the recording is uh, posted. And then also the next one, which is will killing mosquitoes hard other beneficial or harm hurt. other beneficial yeah, harm insects? Or, yeah. That's a very good question. In fact, it's in, in you know, given the, our concerns, um, you know, about mosquito management. First of all, let me start off. Uh, Robin, by saying that, you know, whenever I get a call about mosquitoes being a problem, uh, I always make sure and ask, you know, have you checked your gutters? That is, in my opinion, the number one source of mosquitoes in urban environments. You know, our gutters, you may look up there and I say, did you check your gutters? You look up there and it's like, well, they seem to be doing okay. And I'm not just talking about leaf debris. If we've had, uh, you know, ice or snow uh, on those gutters in the winter, which we tend to then forget about in the summer, you know, the gutter uh, uh, sloping could have been changed. In other words, every gutter that you have on your house should have a very slight slope so the water runs to the to um, downspouts. Anything that changes that, and from firsthand experience, I can tell you it doesn't take much, uh, can then lead to water standing in the gutter. So that's the first thing I always say. Second, if you do have a company coming in to, uh, to do a mosquito application, as part of 
what they do and on the label of the products. And this is very important for everyone to focus on here. Remember the label is the law. Anytime you apply an insecticide, you must read and follow the label directions. It is a legal document. And so those applicators should be doing two things. First, they shouldn't be applying to any plant that is flowering. Second, if they're applying to your property, they should always keep their backs to the neighboring property. They should never be spraying so there's any drift off site. Of course, vice versa, if they're applying to your neighbors, it shouldn't drift over on your properties. So yes, you know, spraying for mosquitoes could suppress beneficial insects. Uh, the company's doing the work though, they, they try very hard. And of course, you know, nothing's, nothing's uh, without some error occasionally, but uh, they are bound actually by the label to not just try hard, but very much try to avoid harming beneficial insects. On the other hand, mosquito fogging, you know, that's problematic. Because as you can imagine, you know, as we fog for mosquitoes where we're using a very broad based application, um, yes, it, it will harm beneficial insects. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, you know, weighing one over the other, except I want to go back. The number one mosquito management approach is to try to address the reproductive side of things, try to address where they're breeding. And Robin's saying she lives by a creek. If it's a free flowing creek, Robin, you shouldn't have a mosquito problem. If it is a stagnant creek, there's gonna be some issues there. I doubt that it's a stagnant creek. So once again, if it's free flowing, mosquitoes, black flies like free flowing, mosquitoes don't, not so much. But I think your situation could be fired by something else. GG, I've gone way over time, and I apologize for we're, that. We're fine, and we had we have uh, six more questions in the uh, question and answer chat box. Oh, um, I didn't see that. Oh, here we go. I'm going to bring that up. I have a significant problem with columbine and dogwood sawfly larvae. I have plenty of flowers. What should I plant in particular to help the predators? Well, so columbine and, 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 and I mean, we're talking about two different things here. Um, both of these pests tend to cycle drastically, particularly dogwood sawfly. So let's address that first. Dogwood sawfly, um, I mean, I can say this by revisiting different places over the years, same places, I should say, to take pictures of it. One year it's bad, next year it's gone. Now, why do you suppose it's gone? Same with columbine sawflies. Year after year, they can cycle drastically. Now you say, what can you, uh, you have plenty of flowers. Uh, should you plant anything in particular? Well, I would say that you're doing the right thing. Just let nature, some years it's going to be higher than other. I get, I'm going to, I'm kind of dancing around something, but I, I'm just going to hit this very directly. A good example are foxes and rabbits. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, he's really gone off the, the edge here. But we all know that foxes eat rabbits, but rabbits cannot produce foxes. The rabbits are the columbine and dogwood sawflies. The foxes are what we're trying to attract. But occasionally, those pests will outstrip, just like rabbits will outstrip, will outproduce their predators, and, and in this case, parasitoids. But then, you know, things will cycle back. It's simply a matter of, of okay, so let's have, we, we might have to put up some years with more pests than other years. We're not gonna have the same impact by what I'm teaching today as we would in an insecticide, but you don't get something for nothing either. So again, it's a matter of cycling through. Now, Jason is asking, how can we control Japanese beetles? Will natural predators help with the control of these ferocious pests? Well, not so much the adults, Jason, but I would actually ask, are you seeing Japanese beetles in high numbers every year? Well, I can say, you know, if you're in greater Cincinnati, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've had populations cycle drastically from year to year to year. If we'd spun the clock back to about 35 years ago, maybe a little longer when Japanese beetles, they were actually introduced in 1913, I think, in New Jersey. And they've been moving west ever since. 
So if we'd spin the clock back about 30, 35 years ago, uh, Japanese beetle, were, well, they were apocalyptic here. Why is it now, as a matter of fact, you don't see them with the same numbers year after year as you do all the way out to Western Illinois? It's because of the natural predators and parasitoids. So I would, you know, I'd submit that we're already seeing Japanese beetles being controlled and don't have the perception that these are bad every year because they're not. Dutch elm disease, could it have been eliminated by flowers? Well, back to, let me jump in there for a second on the Japanese beetles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one item, when clients call in, they ask about the traps to use and I ask oh. them where they have them placed at. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry so for laughing. <laughs> make sure that if you, oh no, that I, I yeah. totally get it. Make sure that if oh, you are using point. a trap, that you have it way far away from the plants that you are wanting to control it. Because otherwise, all you're doing is attracting those Japanese beetles to your given plants that you're wanting to keep it away from. Actually, I go even further, Gigi. I started laughing because, you know, there's an old saying that if you're using a trap, give it to your neighbor. Um, Japanese, <laughs> Japanese beetle traps are best used for monitoring, not management. Right. Um, they, as Gigi, as you're saying that first, you know, if you have, uh, you, if you have them, I'm going to get this backwards and correct me if I'm wrong. If you have the upwind, yeah, upwind of plants you want to control, the beetles are going to fly right over the plants you want to, or you want, you want to protect. Beetles are going to fly right over the plants you want to protect. And as you just said, it'll draw in more. Also, uh, you know, research has clearly shown, in fact, multiple studies um, that were actually done in Worcester, Ohio at the research center, that if you put a trap, you know, in turf grass, right around that trap, you're going to have a higher number of the immature Japanese beetles that we call grubs. So the traps really are not useful at all as a management tool other than monitoring which, you know, quite honestly, over the last 10 years, I've kept numbers of Japanese beetles. I mean, I've been actually go because I, and, and once again, the population has gone up and down, up and down. If you have a bad year, it's gonna be followed by years where you're not gonna see them. Dutch elm disease could have been eliminated by flowers, no. And the reason is because you have a <clears throat> non-native, both beetle, and disease causing organism, a fungus that the beetle carries, non-native that is targeting a native tree, American elm. So quite frankly, and this brings up a very, I get asked this a lot, you know, would flowers control emerald ash borer? No, because parasitoids and predators are not going to eliminate that non-native because it has so much food that did not evolve the ability to defend itself against the beetle. And this is the problem with non-native insects. And Gigi, as you know firsthand, I mean, Asian longhorn beetle in, in your neck of the woods, it's not going to be eradicated or even suppressed much by, by uh, predators and parasitoids mm -hmm. because it has free reign. It has nothing else out there to manage it. And you might say, but wait a second, Joe, you just said Japanese beetles can be managed this way. Japanese beetles are not tree killers, folks. So Japanese beetles will not kill the host, whereas we're talking about something that kills hosts. What else do we have here? These are good questions. Rather than using an insecticide on boxwood leaf miner, is there a predatory insect control? Well, <laughs> Ben, this is... This, I actually didn't see the question uh, when I was talking about Dutch elm disease. Boxwood leaf miners are non-native pests. I actually should have brought this up earlier. I need to add this in because when we have non-native pests, we're, I mean, and I don't want to say all bets are off because just as I said, Japanese beetles have now been with us long enough till they're behaving almost like native pests. Same with gypsy moth in the eastern part of the United States. In other words, the predators and parasitoids have caught up to them. Brown marmorated stink bugs, same thing. It was predicted for them to flood Ohio, and we just, we're just not seeing them. 
like they were seen in, Mass in the Massachusetts, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. But if we look at boxwood leaf miners, there are two things to consider. First, again, they're non-native, and I, I, Ben, their populations in greater Cincinnati are just continuing to rise. We have not gotten to the place yet where we have predators and parasitoids commonly finding that non-native. And that's an important point. Predators and parasitoids have to learn what to eat if it's a non-native. Uh, as I said, the same thing happened with brown marmorators. Now, there are some birds that prey upon boxwood leaf miners, but right now, the best thing that we can consider doing is to perhaps plant boxwoods that are not susceptible, which there are quite a number out there now. Many of them are not susceptible. So if you go online and Google boxwood leaf miner or boxwood select, you know, uh, boxwoods, you, you'll find that data. And that's about the best thing we can do right now. Anne's asking, are there any groups of plants that reduce Japanese beetles? And cre and, well, kind of the same idea, Anne. Now, <clears throat> based on, um, I'm sorry, when I meant the same, uh, same idea behind this idea that, okay, Japanese beetles, non-native, but it's been discovered by, uh, by even native, a lot of native predators and parasitoids. Believe it or not, though, uh, one of the best appears to be these late blooming things. Because think about it, the grubs of Japanese beetles. And let's not focus on just Japanese beetle folks. As a matter of fact, if I go out and look at the grubs and turf grass in greater Cincinnati now, I actually very seldom find Japanese beetle grubs. They're most often uh, a, a southern mass chafer produces the same types of grubs, do the same type of feeding. Uh, and by the way, the mass chafers feed at night, so we don't see the adults. But um, if you take a look at when the grubs are at their easiest to find by predators, it's in late summer to early fall before the grubs, the white grubs, both Japanese beetles and chafers, go into the soil to overwinter. So what blooms late in the season? Well, one that, uh, as I said, Dan Potter at University of Kentucky saw a very good connection with goldenrods. And by the way, very quickly, I just, I, I hope I don't need to dispel this. Goldenrod does not add to hay fever. The goldenrod pollen is very sticky and very heavy. It's designed to be carried by pollinators. Goldenrod depends on insect pollinators, and even its pollen is designed to be carried that way. Uh, the true problem at that time of year is are the ragweeds, both common and giant ragweeds. Their pollen is meant to be distributed by the wind, but you hardly see the flowers. But anyway, getting back to late blooming plants would be very helpful for grub management. Are lady beetles the best control for aphids or something else? Oh, lady beetles are very good, but not the only one. Um, the surfed flies that I mentioned already are fantastic managers of aphids. Actually, <laughs> when I teach about pest management, I always say, you know, everything eats aphids. Aphids are the wildebeest of the insect world. You know, we look at wildebeest on the Serengeti Plain, everything, crocodiles, lions, everything eats wildebeest. It's the same with aphids. So we have lady beetles, we have the surfing flies or hoverflies. We also have not lace bugs, bugs are bad, lace wings, they eat aphids. We have a whole litany of things that eat aphids and are very effective at it. How Let's see, so, and zonal geraniums work to control Japanese beetles. There's an old story about this. Do you know anything about this? Well, it's this idea, and I don't know. I uh, This idea of certain plants that, that emit uh, volatiles can suppress certain pests. Uh, there's no data that I'm aware of relative to uh, zonal geraniums or any of the geraniums that have since suppressing Japanese beetles. Um, that's a myth. Um, I'd actually go so far to say a lot of the research on some of this is so-called research, but is anecdotal, which is a shame because I do think there's some value. In fact, 
we, we you know we do know that there, that some insects are um, you know are put off by certain volatiles for plants. It's how insects find their host plants. On the other hand, when we use an insect repellent that is plant-based, we are using that repellent at a concentration that never occurs in nature. And that's very important. So planting plants out there and thinking you're going to, you know, like zonal geraniums or others, and think you're going to uh, ward off certain insects, eh, probably not at all. Um, it's not the same as the concentrated form. Is there anything that preys on spotted wing drosophila? Boy, I wish there was. Actually, there are a lot of things. Uh, unfortunately, once again, oh, and I need to say the spotted wing drosophila does have the same lifestyle in many ways as our native drosophila. And so uh, what am I talking about here? Drosophila melanogaster is a native uh, fruit fly we often see coming into our bananas in the home. So they have the same lifestyle. So the same predators and parasitoid will affect both. Here's the problem with spotted wing drosophila. They go into that fruit at, at a level and an infestation rate that's just almost like, well, it's just like nothing else that we have because it is a non-native. The other problem is that that because it goes into the fruit so much earlier, I mean, if you let fruit rot, you'll get our native Drosophila fruit flies, but the spotted wing goes into it so much earlier that it tends to, the maggots tend to dodge predation. The adults, on the other hand, though, get gobbled up by a lot of things, but this is a fly and has a very high reproductive rate. I think that does it, doesn't it? Is that everything, Gigi? Yeah. My that goodness. looks like all the questions. Everybody oh, suffered through. One... <laughs> oh. Do you feel bird waters are a problem in relation to mosquitoes? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you do need to dump those out. They are, I mean, remember, particularly in the heat of the, of the summer, uh, any standing water uh, can lead to mosquitoes reproducing. And the hotter, the better. In other words, in the heat of the summer, some species of mosquitoes can can go from egg to adults in less than a week, actually three to four days for some species. So yes, if you if you're you know this is why we always say in terms of mosquito management, you know pay close attention to bird, you know where you're watering birds and 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 sometimes bird feeders can collect water. Uh, just just be aware of that. All right, I think that's it, isn't it, Gigi? My goodness. That's unless uh, somebody else has another question to throw in the chat box, then we will call it a day. I do see the sun coming out down here in the south, so hopefully uh, <laughs> it will be heading your direction if it hasn't already, and those as the clouds disappear. Uh, please go out and enjoy your afternoon. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.